Ping. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. If you'd like to stand with us, then we'll be uh, beginning with Everlasting God. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. up on wings like eagles. You can be seated. Champaign First Church of Nazarene, good morning. How are we doing today? Good morning. It's good to see you. I want to say I am glad each and every one of you are here today. It is good to see your faces. I am glad you're here, and I'm glad you're watching online that you are with us too. There's some things going on in our, our church community this week and, and the rest of the month that I want to share with you. Uh, Thursday evening, 7 p.m., we have the Zone Mission Rally at Monticello. Um, and if you want to uh, go to that, I, I remember carpooling was encouraged, but that is this week, the 20th, I believe. We're also working on crisis care kits. Uh, the supplies for that, directions for that are in the back. If you want to make a crisis care kit, we encourage you to do so, as well as boxes for Operation Christmas Child. Those boxes are in the back as well, and there's directions on, on the, the paper as well if you want to make a box for Operation Christmas Child. This month, on the 30th, we are doing trunk or treat in the parking lot. Woo! Trunk or treat. Uh, and that is 4 to 6 p.m. And if you want to help out, we will take your help. If you want to provide a trunk, you want to provide some candy, you are more than welcome. And we encourage you to participate when we have a good night with the community. We appreciate that. Um, also, uh, this season we're in is cold and flu season. I had a two, I had the two different jobs telling me to, to, to get the, uh, to get my flu shot. And I mean, luckily I was able to get paid for one of them. But the point of that being is that um, we encourage you to um, get your flu shot if you want to get your flu shot. But also if you're not feeling well, if you're under the weather, um, it's, it's okay to, to stay home and, and watch online so you don't share that with other people. Um, that's okay. We do have online capabilities. We do have the ability to uh, stream our services. So you are, you are welcome to do that. You're welcome to stay home if you don't feel well. That's okay. And also, today, right after the service, 
uh, there is a, a baby shower for little Madeline. So everyone in the church is welcome to come and attend that baby shower. Um, and those are all the things that I have to share. And at this time, I want to invite the ushers forward as we uh, give our tithes and our offerings. I invite you all to, to pray with me. Lord God, we are grateful for this day and we are grateful for all the many different ways that you have blessed us. Lord God, we are, we are grateful for what you have placed into our lives. And Lord God, because you have blessed us and given to us, we are able to give back. So Lord God, I ask that you bless our tithes, bless our offerings, bless each gift that we give and bless each one who gives, Lord God. I ask that you use this to the furtherance of your kingdom, Lord. And it's in your name, in your son's name, in the name of the Spirit, that we pray. Amen. We need him every hour, amen? Amen. All right, we're going to continue in worship uh, with a more contemporary version of that song, uh, Lord, I Need You. If you'd like to stand or remain seated, however you feel most comfortable. Christ in me. 
So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name, I will worship your holy name, Lord, I'll worship your holy name. Amen. Thank you to the worship team uh, for leading us to the throne. I, I did not get the green memo uh, this morning, so I'm, I looked up. I was like, wow, apparently I didn't get that email um, on today being a green Sunday. Um, but, uh, but I'm so, so thankful to have uh, a worship team that can lead us uh, to the throne uh, before we dive into the word. Um, and this morning, uh, we, we are continuing our little, <clears throat> our short little series uh, called Reality Check. Um, sometimes, as I said last week, sometimes we need, a, we need a reality check. We need to take off our rose-colored glasses. We need to take off the blinders that sometimes cloud our vision to see the reality of the world around us. And last week, we talked um, a little bit about the fact that our world is divided, that sometimes our church is divided. We are divided on so many different things, whether it's uh, you know who you root for with football. Illinois won again last yesterday. Um, I, I did see that it is the first time since 1984. I was not born yet. That Illinois has beaten Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa in the same season. Um, so that was pre-birth of David uh, that that happened. Uh, but they won yesterday. So it's who you root for. You know, Cubs, Cardinals, Bears, Packers, Illinois, and whoever else. Um, sometimes it's political. Sometimes it's cultural. Sometimes it's whatever. We are divided as a culture. Sometimes within the church we're divided based on doctrine or beliefs or little things. We can be divided, but it's God's desire that we be united. He says so in Scripture. He says that we're called to be united, to be one body, many members. And so we talked about how we are, we are called to take off the blinders, to see the world as it is, and to, to work to be united as one. If it at all depends on you, live at peace with one another. And this week we're going to dive into a little different reality of the world, um, and that is the reality of our world becoming increasingly non-Christian. Um, I use that term uh, very specifically because a few years ago there was a buzzword going around Christian circles and it was post-Christian. We were in a post-Christian world. Um, I don't think we're there anymore. I think we've moved past that. In fact, doing my uh, doctoral dissertation and a lot of the things I'm reading says that we are actually moving into a non-Christian society. And what does that look like and how do we do ministry and, and the reality that the world that some grew up in, I'm a little younger than some, and so it wasn't my lifetime, but the world that some grew up in, where everybody and their brother went to church. Everybody and their brother had some sort of religious affiliation, and that is no longer the case. And so we've got we've to be willing to take the blinders off and to see uh, the world around us as it is. So this morning we will be in uh, chapter 10 of the, the book of Luke. Luke was, uh, uh, it's an eyewitness account of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how he lived and moved and worked here on the earth. Uh, in the in the three years of his ministry, um, and and I love Luke's uh, gospel. I love his perspective on things. Um, he tends to be a little bit more, um, I don't know. Just he comes at it with a different perspective because because of his profession. Um, and I love how he how he shares, especially the Christmas story. As we get into Advent and the Christmas story, um, we'll dive in there. But we're in the tenth chapter of Luke, verses one and two. 
And uh, so if you uh, would, if you have your Bible with us, join in and stand in the reverence of reading of, God, of the reading of God's Word as we look at Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. It says, The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. Father, we thank you that this morning, God, as we pull our our rose-colored glasses off, as we look past our blinders and see the world around us, God, that you have um, more in store for us, God, that as we look into this passage of Scripture, God, we can see that the harvest is plentiful, God, and that you're working the harvest and you want us to be a part of it. I pray that this morning you would challenge us, God, that you would, you would shift our hearts and our minds and our vision to, to be part of what you're doing, God, that we would no longer think uh, and, and think of the way things have been, but the way things are and the way things you want them to be, God. Would you change us, challenge us, move us, transform us this morning? We ask this in Jesus' powerful and precious name. Amen. You may be seated. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, so pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send more laborers into his harvest field. A few years ago in the church of the Nazarene, um, and it's still going on, there is a a ministry called Dynamic Church Planting International, DCPI, and it's about planting churches. uh, There's a a very real reality in in Christian cultures today that churches are dying, and and churches are closing their doors every day, and people are leaving the church. Uh, they They used to call it the rise of the gones, Now they call it the rise of the nuns, people who profess no religious affiliation. People are leaving. Churches are closing. They can't pay their bills. The doors are closing. And so there's this movement of trying to plant more churches and trying to try to spring up new ministries to try and reach people. And the Church of the Nazarene uh, used to have a a few years back, uh, maybe eight or ten years ago, there were all these trainings going on. And so I went through these uh, DCPI trainings on learning how to plant churches as a church and learning how to do next-gen ministry and church planting um, and and the, the passage of Scripture attached to that was Luke chapter 10, verse 2. And uh, they, they challenged us to set an alarm on our phone at 10.02 so that every time 10.02 happens that you would pray that prayer. Jesus, we realize the harvest is, is big. Would you send out more laborers into your harvest field? And still to this day at 10.02, in fact, this morning at 10.02, my alarm buzzed on my desk and I prayed that prayer. The reality check for this morning is the harvest is huge. The harvest is massive. It's beyond our comprehension. The, the harvest that Jesus talks about in this passage, the people he talks about, is so abundant we cannot even comprehend it. There's no way that we would be able to uh, visually see it if he, if he put it out in front of us. So I've had the op- opportunity um, this fall. Thank you for those who have prayed and supported me as, I've, as God has opened a door in my life to officiate college football. And for that to be a ministry for me, um, I'm so appreciative of everybody who's praying for that. But because of that, I've had the opportunity to travel all over the state of Illinois in the last few months. Um, I've been to northwestern parts and central parts and western parts and all over parts. And um, as I've been driving, I have seen more corn and soybean fields in the last few months than I think I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, Literally miles and miles and miles and miles of corn and soybean fields. And I've gotten to see the corn as it's gone from there to knee high to, and and now it's being harvested. And uh, when they harvest it and you're driving down the road, it's literally like a cloud of dust. You can't see anything. Um, So that's a joy to learn. But I've seen miles and miles and miles and miles of harvest fields. As far as the eye can see in places, you get out in some places in central western Illinois, and it is so flat that I promise you if you had binoculars, you probably could see the other side of the earth. Um, It is so flat, and you just see harvest fields for days. And that's not even scratching the surface of the harvest that Jesus is talking about in Luke 10. It's so much. The fields of central Illinois, all that they call it, I, I found out earlier this year, that this area is called the Golden Triangle because of the soil. It makes it, the soil is so rich that apparently it is like the best place to grow corn um, in the entire U.S. Uh, And so the the, the fields in the Golden Triangle, the fields in Illinois, are like a backyard to the harvest field that Jesus is talking about in, in, in Luke 10. It's just, it's so small in comparison because the harvest Jesus is talking about is not corn, or soybeans, or if you're from South Louisiana like Joan Lee Rice, it's people. 
It's the people of the world that Jesus came to save. It's the people of the world that Jesus came and lived and died on a cross that we might have His saving grace and His life abundant here on earth. The harvest is people, it's eternity, it's life. And that can't be measured. It can't be fathomed by our brain. But if we do try to look and put that into perspective, um, I, think, I think it would look a little like this. So according to Pew Research in 2021, they did a, they did a study in 2021, according to Pew Research, less than 64% of people in the United States claim any religious affiliation. Even less than that a church, attend church regularly. So less than 64% of people. The Champaign County metropolitan area, Champaign or Bel- metro area, has a little more than 220,000 people in the population, depending on where you look, 221, 225, give or take. Um, what's four or 5,000 people in an area this big? So 220 plus thousand people. 36% of that is 81,000 people in our metro area that do not claim a religious affiliation. That's literally like 25 miles by like 20 miles. 81,000 people in that area. That is enough people to fill all of Memorial Stadium, which yesterday apparently was close to a sellout, all of Memorial Stadium, all of the State Farm Arena, and still have eight to 10,000 people standing outside waiting. That's a, that's a huge number of people who don't know Jesus in our backyard. That's our harvest field. As we, as we drive around, as we go about life, that's our harvest field. That is putting a number to what Jesus is talking about for us. But let's, let's expand it a little bit. We live in Illinois. I've been here six months. Some of y'all have been here your whole life. Illinois has a population of just under 13 million people. It's kind of wild because I just moved out of a city that had seven. So it's like go from a city to a state that has double. But 13 million people, 36% of 13 million is 4.7 million people, give or take that don't have any religious affiliation, even more that don't attend church. If you were to take those 4.7 million people, I'm a a geographer, I'm a visual guy, I need to see things. So if you were to take those 4.7 million people in the state of Illinois and you were to stand them shoulder to shoulder, we're not even talking arms out, we're just shoulder to shoulder. The average average shoulder width, the the broadness of the shoulders uh, between women and men is roughly about 16 inches, give or take. Um, So if you were to stand everybody shoulder to shoulder in a straight line from this doorstep, it would reach Lubeck, Maine, the furthest easternmost point in the United States, and still have some miles to spare. Other way, east. (laughs) I'm a geographer. (laughs) East. Um, It's actually northeast, but it would reach reach the easternmost point in the United States and still have miles to spare. The harvest is plentiful. It's enormous. It's mind-blowing. There are people all over that need Jesus. And now, I don't know about you, but for me, when I first heard that years back when I was just getting into ministry, it was, it was daunting. I'm an extrovert. I love people. You guys are probably going, yeah, and he talks a lot too. Um, I love people. I love being around people. I love getting to know people. People don't scare me, but the idea of 81,000 people in my backyard that don't know my Jesus, man, wow. That's, that's, that's a daunting thought. As a pastor, that, that's a burden. That's a heavy burden. Thank God that Jesus says, cast your cares on me because I care for you because it's not mine to bear. But that's a heavy burden. When I go down to the Circle K over here on Kentwood, when I drive past Centennial High School and Jefferson High School, we've got some students there. You know, as I pray for students, as I drive past the university, a lot of times I go to the Chipotle down there on campus because it's better than the one over by, uh, over by Culver's. They just, I don't know why, they're just better. Um, but I go down to campus and I see these students right there at the corner of 6th in, in Springfield walking around at the corner of 6th and I think university maybe, I don't know, Um, right there in the heart of campus, just students upon students upon students of every color and every nation, men and women, age, all alike, just people galore. And most of them don't know Jesus. 
Most of them don't know the saving grace of Christ that we know. And you walk by and you just wonder what their story is. And if, if Jesus were to come back today, would they be with us worshiping in eternity? That is a heavy burden. That is a daunting task. The people you work with. Joni works at Carl Hospital. There are people in and out of Carl Hospital every day. Patients and nurses and doctors and administrators. I go in there as a clergy person. I got a cool badge that says so. Um, There are people in there all the time. Do they know the saving grace of Jesus? It's a daunting thought. And it should it should burden our heart immensely. It should change the way we think. But but here's the thing: it can bog us down to the point of almost being unable to do anything it can it can wear on us to the point where we just we just can't do anything else and and the cool thing about this passage is the cool thing about this truth this reality check is even though it is daunting even though it is beyond our imagination even though there is no way on this earth that we could even touch a fraction of that by ourselves god has a plan but god has a plan praise god that the reality check of 36 percent of americans that don't know jesus is not the end of the story thank you jesus that that is not the end of the story god has a plan and is moving and working to see that plan come to fruition if god if, if it was one of these where it's like oh you know only certain people david probably would not be in that boat thank god that there was somebody in young life kevin johnson and um you know, that would come to the school and would love on me and just cared for me for four years and I came to know the saving grace of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, God, that that's not the end of the story for those 36% of Americans and plus who don't even attend. Thank God it's not the end of the story. The reason we know that God has a plan, Peter, loudmouth Peter, Peter who was a little bit brash at times, cutting off ears and things, Peter offers us hope. In his second letter, 2 Peter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. Praise Jesus that he keeps his promises. He's not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. I'm not a patient person. I don't understand slowness. God is always on time. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand. Instead, he is patient with us. Praise God for his patience. Because sometimes it takes more than once for people to learn. Myself pointing at me. He's patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Jesus came and he lived and he died, not so that some could could live with the Father in eternity, but that all could live with the Father in eternity. He came that all would come to repentance. His desire that none should perish. And if that's his desire and he sees the harvest more than we do, He's got a plan. He's working. He's moving. He's doing things to make sure that as many people that can come to know Jesus will. Now, we we are of the Wesleyan-Arminian faith. The Arminian side of that is that we believe in free will. We understand that God is not a puppeteer. God is not going to tell you, David, you are going to believe in me, and you have no choice in that fact. That's not God's, it's not his character. But God will do everything in his power. He will put people in our lives. He will will show us things. He will have people speak into our lives and love on us and care for us to try and get us to understand the grace of Jesus so that we too can be in relationship. And that is God's plan. And he wants us to be a part of it. You are somebody's Kevin Johnson. You are somebody's person that God wants you to, to reach and to move and to work. Luke 10, 1 and 2 says that the Lord of the harvest is the one who sends out harvest, harvest workers. The Lord of the harvest is the one who sends out labors. He's the one who calls and challenges and charges us. And it says in, cha- in, in chapter 10, verse 1, that he sent him out two by two. We're not to do this work alone. It's not something that I can do by myself. And, and Scripture tells us that anywhere two or more are gathered, Two or three, I am with you. Which means when we go together, God is with us. He does the work. God, do you you understand that God can do the work without us? He doesn't need us. God can do anything he wants. He is omniscient. He's omnipotent. he, He can do anything he wants. But the truth is God wants us to be involved, not for his benefit, 
but for ours. God wants us to be involved in the harvest and the reaping of the harvest, not so that He can be blessed, but so that we can receive a blessing. And, and when that harvest is reaped, it encourages us, it spurs us on, and we continue to work. How many of you have had the opportunity to pray with someone to receive Christ? Hopefully at some point in time in life, you've gotten to experience that. As a youth pastor for 16 years, teen camp is a place where the altars are always full. Sometimes it's year after year after year after year. Sometimes I've been that guy on the altar year after year after year after year. Um, sometimes it takes me more than once to learn things. Um, but, but every summer, students would be in the altar praying to receive Christ. And I had the opportunity over and over again to pray with these students that would pour out their heart and say, I just understand that I cannot do this on my own. I, in, in my own doing, I fail. The flesh gets me. I am weak. I cannot do it without the grace of Jesus. I need him in my life. And let me tell you, you talk about gas, being, gas prices being high. That is the eternal fuel for, for your life. You, you pray to receive Christ with somebody, I, I'm good for a year. Like, I'm good until next summer, God. You don't have to do anything else for me. I'm in, let's go. I'm seeing God move. When you, when you see the harvest reaped, man, it just spurs us on. Bless God that, that, that things are happening. I'm in, let's keep going. Here we go, come on. You bring people with us. You will never believe what happened at camp. You need to come next year. I'm, I'm all about that. I'm trying to get some of our pastors on our district, encourage them, some of our senior pastors who may have been out of youth ministry for a long time, come back. It'll bless your socks off. You don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss what God is doing at camp. NYC is coming up next summer. Eight or 9,000 high school students gathering in worship together, praying to receive Christ. Last year, there were so many decision, or I'm sorry, last year, 2019, there were so many decisions for calls into ministry and calls into missions and people receiving Christ and people surrendering things to God. I mean, story after story, I'm good for the next like 30 years. Like, God, you don't have to do anything for me. I'm in. Here we go. Being able to reap that harvest, being able to be a part of what God is doing will challenge and charge you and spur you on and you will want to bring other people with you. You'll never believe what God is doing over there in Champaign. you got to be here. You want to be here. God's doing things. He's prepping. He's planning. He's doing things. You, you want to be there, and people will come with you. The task seems daunting. The task seems daunting, but God, man, thank you, Jesus, for those words. When you, when you, when you see in Scripture something's happening, and, and it seems like it's going down the wrong path, and then you see but. But and therefore are always there for a reason. But God, therefore God, he shows up in our time of need. Right now in 2022, there are more than 36% of the population of the United States that claim no affiliation religiously. They have no, no concept of Christianity. A lot of people gr have grown up and don't know anything about Jesus. You talk about salvation, you talk about sanctification, those big Nazarene S words. Sanctification, you talk about surrendering your life, you talk about hell and heaven, you talk about these things, they don't know. There's no concept. They are literally nuns. It seems daunting, but God has a plan. But God is moving, but the harvest is being reaped. The clouds of dust are showing up. We should see it, and we should want to be involved in it. The harvest is massive, and God has a plan. We understand that, and that leaves one thing. It's time to get to work. It's time for us to get to work. It's time for us to join in in what God is doing. I've been in, been in full-time ministry vocationally for the last 14 years, give or take, but I've been involved in parachurch ministry and ministry before that. That's not a long time. I, I know pastors that have pastored for 30 and 40 years. I know some people, not in this congregation at all, never, um, <laughs> but I know some people have heard it. I've done my time. I've served for years. It's time for other people to serve. I want to bless other people and let them receive the blessing. I, I want to let other people have a chance to serve. Show me in Scripture where it says that we get to retire in ministry. I would love to. It doesn't say, it doesn't say ask the Lord of the harvest to send out new laborers because the old laborers are tired and we need new laborers out there. It says ask the Lord of the harvest to send out more laborers into the harvest field, which means those who are working and have worked need to keep working. 
And, and, and I don't know about you, but, but you, know, you may come up and say, you know what? That's not my skill set or gifting. Children's ministry? Mm-mm. Not my skill set. I have done children's church more than my fair share, and I have to pray a lot through it. Children's ministry is not my gifting, but you know what? God uses people when they're willing to serve. It takes a willingness to serve. Colossians 3, 23 says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. Work takes willingness. When, when, when you know, Madeline, God love her, she is amazing. She's like five weeks old now, I think, four and a half. Not quite sleeping through the night. Um, and when she wakes up, and Morgan, you know, in the middle of the night kind of screams, you know, I don't know whether night tears or whether she just likes screaming in the middle of the night. When they wake up and we wake up, sometimes it's hard for me to get back to sleep. And there are days where I'm like, man, I would love to be able to sleep in until like 10.30 or 11 and then go to the office. But you know what? I've got to get up. I got, there's things I got to do. It takes a willingness to go to work. Same thing for the kingdom. It takes a willingness to be involved. God's not going to force your hand. He's not going to puppet you up out of your bed and say, hey, I want you to go over here and do this. He presents opportunities, but it takes us being willing to do the work. It's not my skill set, my gifting. One of my good friends, good friend Kyle, um, as we call him, he's a guy I've officiated with for three years. He lives in Texas. Literally every time I talk to him on the phone, we, we end up in some sort of spiritual conversation of some kind. And he, like, he's, I mean, says it to the point that I'm like, dude, Pick a different saying. Like, stop saying that. But he says it all the time, and it's a reminder to me that God does not call those he has already equipped. He equips those he calls. So if you say, that's not my gifting or my skill set, David. You know, children's ministry, mm. If you say, yes, Lord, I'm willing, guess what? God's going to equip you for children's ministry in that moment. That may not be your long-term thing. That may not be, but in that moment when you say, yes, Lord, he will, he will equip you for ministry. You know, I, I remember when I was in high school, um, you know, one of, the, one of the people that I knew um, through, through one of the churches, their, their dad had a farm. Um, it was the only farming experience I know. And we went out, they were baling hay. I had never baled hay before. Um, I learned real quick that you don't wear short sleeves or shorts when you bale hay. Um, <laughs> and you bring gloves. And I had no experience but in that moment, God equipped me to be able to do that by offering long sleeve shirts from the people who I was working with and whatnot. But, but God, uh, God equipped me through people to be able to bail, hey, I learned quick. You know, children's ministry, youth ministry, um, greeting, first impressions, preaching, praying, leading worship, going and talking to people about Jesus may not be your gifting or your skill set. Not everybody is Eric. I love Eric. I tell Eric this all the time. He is like, he is so on fire. He reminds me of myself when I first came to know Christ. I think I drove people nuts because I was just so excited. <laughs> but but, but it's, it's contagious, and I love it. Not everybody is Eric that can just go up and be like, do you know how much I love you and how much I want you to know Jesus? That's not everybody's personality, and that's okay. But God will equip. He will equip you to do what it is that you want to do. Trunk or treat. Eh, I'm not sure that I can put a trunk together. I'm not creative. If you say, Jesus, I'm willing, somehow creativity is going to flow out of you. I don't know what it's going to look like, but it'll happen. <clears throat> I'm not creative. We've done a Marvel trunk, and we did a jungle trunk. Like, and Joni's got a plan for another trunk. Like, I, God will equip you to serve. You may say, you know, I'm, I'm too old. Yeah, You may not be able to bail hay anymore. You may not be able to do the physical work of labor. But you can pray. And you can be present. And you can have conversation. It doesn't take physical labor. Sometimes it takes physical labor. Thank God to the people who come in here and clean our church and the people who mow our grass and the people who take care of things. Because it means I don't have to. I'm grateful for that. I've cleaned churches and I've mowed grass. I'm thankful for people who do it. You may, it may not be physical labor for you. It may be something else. We have missionaries all over the world. There are people in the community. There are 56,000 students <coughs> excuse me, on the campus of the University of Illinois, and I don't even know how many on Parkland. There are thousands of students at Centennial and Central High Schools, and Urbana High School, in the middle schools. There are 80, 
three churches, 86 churches on our district with pastors. You can get the list on the, on the district website. You can pray. October's Pastor's Appreciation Month. You can, I dare you. <laughs> there we go. When I was a kid, if somebody dared you to do it, you had to do it. Otherwise, it was bad. I dare you to find a pastor other than David or John, although you can do it with a, to find a different pastor somewhere on our district or another district in the Church of the Nazarene or otherwise and send them a note of encouragement this week. Just want you to know how much I appreciate you and the work that you do in the ministry. It's Pastor's Appreciation Month. You never know what God is going to do through those things. Sending an encouragement to somebody in your neighborhood. Sending a get well. Sending a hey, just want you to know that we're praying for you and we appreciate you. You never know what God is going to do. It's not always physical labor. Maybe it's inviting someone over to your house to eat. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe it's mowing somebody's grass. Maybe I don't, I don't know what God is calling you to do, but the reality is he's calling us to work. Luke 10, 2 says so. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out more labors. We need more labors. God wants to use us. It's time to work. It takes a willingness. It takes a want to. It takes a desire to see people come to know the saving grace of Christ. My prayer for this week and my prayer for the last few years for me has been, I'm, I'm, I've now gone over the hill. I don't know how to describe it. I've now been a Christian longer than I have not. And one of the things that I worry about with that is the longer that I'm a Christian and away from the life that I lived before Christ is that I will, I will forget the grace that I need, the grace, the transformation that happened in Lake Champion, New York, when I sat on a beach and I, I surrendered to Christ and the life transformation that happened. And when, when Rene Frustacci, our speaker, took us around on a, on a walk uh, the next day and told us to pick up a rock that represented our life. And, and she kept talking, she kept talking. We walked back around to the lake and she told us to throw it. And me being the athlete that I was, I'm like, I'm going to throw it farther than everybody else. And we launched that rock into the lake. And she said, you know what? You could search for a million years and never find that rock again. And she pulled a smooth stone out of a box. And he, she said, this is your new life in Christ. Your old life is gone. Your new has come. And I will forever remember that transformative moment in my life when I accepted Christ. But the longer that I'm a Christian, the longer I get away from that moment. And sometimes I forget the grace that I need every day. And sometimes I forget who I was before. And it makes it harder for me to connect with people who don't yet know Jesus. Because I'm like, man, I don't understand why you live the life you live. I don't get it why you want to go out and party. I don't understand why you want to do these things because it's destructive. I don't get it. I forget what it was like before I knew Jesus. I need Jesus to help me to, to be that buffer, to, to, to do what he needs to do for other people through me. God wants to use you to see lives transformed here in Champaign County. He's at work through other churches, <clears throat> Just ask John or I, the Ministry Leaders Network. There are things happening. There's a prayer meeting every other week at, at WGNN, Good News Media, Great News Media. I keep getting corrected about that. Um, where people are praying for God to do things, for God to move in a way that he did back during the Urbana Missions Conferences, for God to bring transformation to this area so that God can send out people to, to impact the kingdom. God is moving and working. The question is, do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to have the joy and the blessing and the hope and the benefit of being part of God's harvest time? Because it's happening around us. And we have the opportunity to do so. And I would, I would absolutely love to talk with you if you're like, man, I want, to, I want to be involved, but I don't know how. Let's pray together. Let's pray together and ask God, what is it that you're passionate about? Where is it that you see God moving in your life and how can you be involved in it? Because the reality is he wants to use us. He wants to use each and every one of us to transform the lives of the people around us so that they too can know the saving grace of Jesus and life abundant here on earth. But it takes a willingness to be willing to do it. The reality check for this week is the harvest is massive. Far bigger than anything we can comprehend. But praise God that he has a plan in place and that he's working and he is moving and he's doing things. And he wants us to be involved in it. He wants us to be able to live in the blessing of lives being transformed. He wants us to see people being transformed. He wants our baptistry to be used where people are saying, you know what, this is my life in Christ and I want people to know about it. He wants us to be involved. But the question is, are we willing to get involved? And so that's the prayer this week. God, where will you use me? I want to be involved. Here I am, send me. You know, the, the, whom shall I send and whom go, who will go for me? Isaiah. 
I don't know what you got planned, but here I am, send me. Samuel, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I want to hear what it is that you're doing. I want to be involved in it. God, bring someone into our life this week that needs to hear from you. Give us the wisdom to see it and the grace to open our arms to it that lives would be transformed. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you that, that sometimes reality is scary <laughs> when we look around the world. And I think about my two young daughters. I was talking to somebody on Friday night, another official, and they were talking about their, 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 their teenage daughters, and that thought just scared me of the fact that Morgan and Madeline being teenagers, I'm so not ready for that. God, give me grace along the way and a lot of people to help out. God, sometimes life can be scary. Sometimes things can be daunting and and, and God, I pray that this morning as we think about the harvest around us, as we think about the 80 plus thousand people in our neighborhood that don't know you, that aren't attending church on a regular basis, God, that, that have no understanding of the saving grace of Jesus, that have no comprehension of what life abundant here on earth and life eternity with the one who created them looks like. I pray, God, that you would challenge us. God, that you would prick our hearts for, for those moments, to get involved in what you're doing. To God, that even if we've served for years and years and years and we're tired, God, there are times that I'm tired. God, I pray that you would give energy, that you would give, give just an abundance of energy, that that, that that fire that comes when we get to pray with someone to receive Christ. God, the, the, just the joy and the hope that abounds. I pray, God, that you would just pour out and overflow that. Onto, the, onto these people and the, and the churches around us. God, Meadowbrook and Windsor Road and CU, at home, CU Church and, and the ministry at CU at home. And, and uh, God, the, the ministries that are happening, would you just pour out your spirit upon that this morning? God, that we would get involved in what you're doing, that we would see people with your eyes, that we would love people with your grace, that we would be able to share through our life and our, our journey the truth of the gospel, of, of our situation and your salvation. God, would you move and would you work that, that our eyes would see the harvest, that it wouldn't be so daunting, God, that we would be able to focus on the, on the things in front of us, that we would understand that you're working in the big picture. And God, you want us to be involved in it. I pray that you would equip us when we say, yes, we're willing. God, when you stretch us beyond our, our comfort zone, maybe into children's ministry or things like that, God, that you would give us the courage to go and, and, the, and the strength to go, and God, that you would equip us for those moments. God, that you would give us everything we need and more. And God, that you would move and work, that it would give us so much joy that the next time you prick our hearts, we would have no answer but yes, Lord, send me. Here I am. God, I pray that lives would be transformed this week in Champaign County. I pray that that number of 81,000 would, would shrink. God, I pray that, that, that people would come to know your saving grace. God, that we would take back territory from the world. That people would come to know the saving grace of Jesus, the life abundant that they can have on here on earth. And I pray, God, that you would use the people in this room to be a part of that. God, help us to be willing to be involved in what you're doing God, we will be quick to give you the praise and glory because without you, nothing is possible. This harvest would be so daunting, we wouldn't even be able to chip away at one corn stalk. But God, with you, all things are possible and you are moving and working. So we will praise you and we will thank you for what you are already doing. God, for what you're going to do, the plans you have in place. God, we praise you in advance for that. For the lives that will be transformed, for the baptisms that will happen, for the people who will be called into ministry and missions, God, for the people who will be called to be a part of what you are doing in their vocation, God, we praise you. God, use us this week, challenge us this week, change us and help us to be a part of the harvest that's happening, and we will praise you and we'll thank you in Jesus' powerful and precious name, amen. Amen. Well, I'm so glad you were with us this morning. Uh, don't forget... Uh, baby shower right after church if you want to stick around. I'm going home to take care of kiddos. Um, Carson was not happy about that. <laughs> um, but um, baby shower, crisis care kits out there. Um, we're, we are working to replenish the stock that has been given out uh, from our district. So if you want, you don't have to do a full kit. If you want to just go, you find something on the list that's on sale and you want to just dump it in the box, we can put them together. Um, Operation Christmas Child, trunk or treat. There's a sign up in the back. Um, if you want to be involved with a trunk, we need help with registration when people show up. Um, we need help directing things, parking, all kinds of stuff. Um, so if you want to be involved, we need your help. And then uh, lastly, mission, Zone Mission Rally this Thursday night, 7 o'clock at Monticello Church. Um, if people want to carpool, go ahead and carpool. Um, 
I understand, I don't know, I haven't confirmed, but I understand that there may be a, a camp scholarship. Um, if you're a teenager and want to show up, uh, I think it's literally if you just show up, you get entered for it. Um, so so we, I, may, I may pull some of our teens there on, on Thursday night, but it'll be awesome. It's going to be a great time uh, to hear what God is doing on our, on our district. So make sure you're there, and uh, we will look forward to seeing you guys then, uh, Wednesday night and next Sunday as we finish the Reality Check series. Um, and uh, just so excited for what God is doing here in the area. But if you will stand and receive a blessing um, as, we, uh, as we leave and uh, go about our day, I pray that God would do incredible things this week. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and uh, may he make his face to shine upon you. God, may his grace just be poured out over you that it spills out on everyone around you. May he turn his face towards you as an attentive father and see you where you are, and may he give you peace this week. Amen. Lord bless you. You're dismissed.